I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today, we are continuing our journey through Middle Earth and talking about The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, the 2002 film directed by Peter Jackson, screenplay by Fran Walsh, Philip Boyens, Stephen Sinclair, and Peter Jackson, based on the novel by J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Arand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayotas. Hi. So here we are in part two of The Two Towers. Lots of stuff to talk about. I'm very excited about it. But before we jump in, there's kind of a cool new thing that's happening with this episode. So Spotify has a new feature that they have selected our podcast and our audience to kind of test out, which is a new Q&A feature. So basically, we can ask you a question, you the audience. And in the Spotify app, if you're listening in the Spotify app, you can reply with your answer right in the app, and it'll send it right to us. And we'll be able to see what your answer is. And you'll be able to check out other people's answers. And it's just a fun little way for you to quickly engage with us within the Spotify app. So we have a question for you guys. Which do you prefer the theatrical cut of Lord of the Rings or the extended cut? And why? Uh, and we're going to be talking about that in, in just a moment. So anyway, if you are listening on the Spotify app, head to the place where you can just type in your your answer and we'll check it out. I'm very curious to hear what everyone's thoughts are going to be. And you're going to hear our thoughts on, on it right now. Uh, and as a quick note, this is it's starting as an Android only feature, but it'll be rolling out to iOS later this month. It might already be there for you. So uh, anyway, we're excited to test that out and hear from you guys. And so now I want to hear from you guys. So the two towers extended versus theatrical cut. So this movie was the one that I wanted to watch the extended cut of because back when I was really into the films, after watching all the different versions, for some reason, Michael from 10, 12 years ago, whatever it was, had decided that he never needed to see extended versions of Fellowship or Return of the King ever again. But Two Towers Extended was a must watch. Wow. And that was really interesting watching the extended of Two Towers this time because I did not feel that way <laughs> this time. There's like basically one critical thing that I think you do need from extended. Which is? Which is the Faramir story, I feel like is mm -hmm. generally, I think we would all agree on that. But I'm, mm. so this is what I'm, so that's my experience. I want to hear from you guys, uh, your thoughts on Two Towers specifically, theatrical and extended. Brian, what are your thoughts on, on the extended? Because you're generally pro. Personally, I'm just I just want to watch the extended versions of these movies only ever just because I want more of these movies. But that's not really an argument for anything. That's just my <laughs> personal preference. <laughs> but uh, specifically, a couple things come to mind. One is the Faramir scene. I remember watching this movie, you know, in theaters a couple of times. And then I think we got the theatrical cut and my friends and I watched it a couple of times. And then finally, the extended came out and we were watching it together. And then you have that flashback scene with Boromir and Denethor. And then Denethor says, oh, a chance for Faramir, captain of Gondor, to show his quality. And my friends and I just all went, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that random line that he says to himself in the theatrical cut is about. You know, Alex had said once, I think we were talking off mic, that he thinks the, the best cut of these movies is the Alex cut, which is somewhere between <laughs> the theatrical and the extended. And I, as like somebody who doesn't edit professionally, I don't that doesn't occur to me. I'm like, well, there's two cuts. I'm going to watch the one, the extended because each of these movies, there's a different reason why I think the extended has something in it that I, to me, the movie is incomplete without it. That doesn't mean I'm arguing every single extended scene needs to be in there. It just means I don't want to watch it without this scene or that scene. So therefore it's extended. Sure. But the other thing I'll say about two towers specifically is I remember seeing it in the theater and just feeling like this is just three hours of battle. And it's not. It's probably right. one hour, but it, it's just how I felt. It just felt like it was suddenly we're in this movie and now we're at war and holy crap, things are happening. And what I really like about the extended is almost all of the added stuff is before the Helm's Deep, mm -hmm. which means I think the flow of the extended is you're building, building, building up to this battle. So when it finally happens, you're you're more excited for it than just feeling like it's being kind of thrown in your face. I don't know if I would feel that way if I watched the theatrical cut again, but that was why I appreciated the extended first time I watched it was it felt like the battle was this reward rather than just it's here the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, those are those are my overall thoughts on it. Yeah. Well, and so, Trisha, this was your first time watching the extended Cut. Yeah. So yeah, what was your takeaway from that? 
I definitely really appreciate what you said just now, Bri, about the balance of the movie, because Mm -hmm. in my brain, having only seen the theatrical up until this point, I kind of feel like it's half Helm's Deep. Like, I don't exactly know Mm -hmm. how long the amount of time Michael's maybe looking it up right now. It is that like (laughs) Helm's Deep actually occupies in this movie. It is the climax of the film. And so because it is, you know, they basically kept everything that they shot at Helm's Deep, which is a lot. And then, you know, all of the, as you're mentioning, Brian, everything else they cut, they cut out of other places. So it does create a different pacing and a different sense of balance to the movie to have all of the extended scenes in it. I hard agree about the Faramir scenes. I had no idea (laughs) who (laughs) Faramir was really like up until watching all of this. And I'm like, oh, all, all of this is really important character stuff for Faramir and just generally helps explain a lot about what the heck Gondor is and Mm, like the different kingdoms of men, right? So you have Rohan, you have Gondor and all this stuff. It was really, really helpful to me to watch this time around in terms of like, would I sit down and immediately watch it again? Um, Or like next time I'm sitting down to watch Lord of the Rings, is this the one I would pick if I could, you know, pick one of the two? And honestly, I think maybe, I think the thing for me is I wasn't familiar enough with the theatrical cut anyway. Like these are movies I've seen a handful of times, but I haven't, I don't have them memorized beat by beat. I, you know, was experiencing this while I was watching it where I was like, have I seen this scene before? Or is this Mm. extended? I don't really Mm -hmm. know, but it it does feel like it fits and it is telling part of the story. And so sure, like, you know, maybe I will be here for the extended from here on in because I thought that they did add a lot. And I really like, you know, I'm not, Uh, we can get into this later i'm not a huge war movie person generally and so all of the extended scenes lessen the war movie the the amount of war movie it was (laughs) yeah the ratio and make it more character it's all character right yeah like all the extended scenes are just more character stuff and that's what i'm generally here for so yeah, yeah i think i'm with you yeah i'm so i'm scrubbing through the theatrical cut and basically helms deep they arrive there and start to prepare it the two hour mark and then Gandalf and all the people ride down the far too steep hill at the two hour and 40 minute mark. So it's right. about a 40 minute sequence in the theatrical cut of battle and intercutting, of course, with Mary and Pip and the Ents and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. The extended edition also kind of like you guys are saying, it, it does set up because the second film requires you to understand the politics of men a lot more, like we were saying in our fellowship Mm. episode. It does slow the momentum down, I think, coming out of the fellowship, especially the fellowship theatrical version. For sure. By the end of that, you're like, cool, like, let's keep going with the ring. We're going to get to Mordor. And then the first two hours of Two Towers Extended is here's a bunch of people you don't know, and we're going to like make you care about them because they're going to matter soon. It slows down kind of the overall story momentum, but it, it does build up your investment in the characters that are going to start mattering. And it forward. really mm-hmm. enriches the experience of watching Return of the King, which I think yes. is Re- something yeah. that is critical because to me, Return of the King, we we will get there, but is kind of the, I don't know, just it's just the wrap up one, right? And so, but in order for the wrap up to make uh, like mean anything, right? a lot of the stuff is what you need is here in the two towers. Yeah. And so, Alex, you've talked about, yeah, the Alex cut of what what you would keep and what you wouldn't keep. So, (laughs) yeah, I'm curious for the two towers. What are the things from extended you think are necessary? What things would you want to cut out? Yeah, I think I I still stand by my desire for an Alex cut because, you know, (laughs) none of the Fellowship of the Ring comes the closest, as I mentioned last time, to where I would pretty much be fine living in everything from the extended edition. There's probably a couple scenes I would take out uh, personally, but for the most part, it was working for me. Two Towers, I think there are a lot of scenes, especially in the first half, that do change the pacing for me in a way that I think makes the movie suffer. Like I, I watched the theatrical mm. again after watching the extended, and the pace in the theatrical is great. Like it, You feel like you're just off to the races of these you know, different storylines we're intercutting, and it just moves along at a great clip and there's a lot of just little uh moments like orcs kind of bickering more (laughs) for a while with mary and pippin you know and you know more like kind of weird awkward tree beard scenes and things that don't really add anything and just kind of 
prevent a sense of momentum from developing. So I really appreciate the theatrical pacing of the of the first half of the film. But then as the film goes on, there are character moments that I think are really crucial that are missing. There's some stuff with Aragorn and Eowyn that I think mm-hmm. is really nice in the extended. The scene where he frees the horse, Brego, he kind of calms down this horse and frees him from the stables. That's the horse that comes upon him at the riverbank and picks mm-hmm. him yeah. up. Which, you know, if you're watching the theatrical cut, he goes over the hill like with no <laughs> horse, like on a warg. So like, we're, like, whose horse is this? What horse? Like, where did this horse come <laughs> from? It, it means a lot more when you've seen him kind of like talk Elvish to this other horse and mm-hmm. develop a bond with it. Uh, and then you have the Faramir stuff, which I think, honestly, his character is totally incomplete without these additional scenes, mm-hmm. particularly the flashback sequence. There's even some smaller moments when he, it's a little cheesy, but when he has that little almost poetic thought about the fallen soldier, you know, mm-hmm. that establishes Faramir as this interesting three-dimensional character. He he has some ambivalence about war. He's kind of a more sensitive type. He's not, you know, Boromir. He's different. And in the theatrical cut, all you get are the parts of him kind of just being a dick. Like he's <laughs> totally <laughs> he's basically like just a dick in the theatrical cut. He automatically is like, bind them, take them when he runs into Frodo, where as in the extended, there actually is an exchange for a moment. You know, they they speak for a while. Uh, all you see is him getting Gollum and kicking him and like abusing him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then at the end, he kind of does this sudden 180 and he's like, never mind. Like, I understand you now, Frodo Baggins. You can go. And <laughs> there's so many pieces that are missing that it doesn't really feel like a real character. It just feels like this guy who's here to be an impediment to Frodo for some reason and then lets him go for some reason. And I remember it actually really bothered me watching it in theaters for the first time because I had read the books at that point. You know, when I saw Fellowship, Mm -hmm. I just read The Hobbit. But between Fellowship and Two Towers, I read the whole trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I knew Two Towers didn't have this kind of whole detour to Osgiliath. That's not in the books. Like they don't, it doesn't get that far with Faramir. That's all kind of invented just to kind of give Frodo a climax in this book because they saved the actual climax for Frodo in Two Towers for Return right. of the King. Mm-hmm. The, the, the whole She Loved the Spider sequence is in Two Towers in the book. So they, they pushed all that to Return of the King and had to kind of invent some kind of a climactic moment. Mm-hmm. And so the farmer of the book, actually, he changes his tune pretty quickly. I think he is tempted by the ring momentarily, but he reveals he is not his brother. He is different. He's more thoughtful. He's able to let the ring go. And I was really annoyed seeing this movie version of him where he's just an a-hole the whole time. You know, it's like, it like, who is this right. character? What are they doing to him? Yeah. So all that said, I think, you know, in my Alex cut, most of the Faramir stuff would come back, if not all of it. I understand they wanted to get it down to like, I think the movie is almost exactly three hours three in the hours. theatrical cut. Yeah. But, you know, they went over three hours for Return of the King. And I think... I honestly think the movie suffers for not having those scenes because it really robs Frodo's plot line of feeling as meaningful as the other plot lines. You know, Frodo is just kind of being held captive by these mean guys. And it doesn't it it doesn't like mean a whole lot. It doesn't mean the same. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't let us get to see Sean Bean again. Like, right. right. We get to see Sean Bean for a couple. Really good point. Yeah. And it even sets up what Osgiliath is. It, you, know, you, right. you even have more, more. You have more context for the finale of the film because you've, you've established, oh, this is a place that they just retook from Mordor mm-hmm. and now it's under attack again. Like there's, there's not much meaning in that, in that finale without those scenes. Yeah. And I think one thing I hadn't appreciated before is that the Faramir flashback scene, you're tying the three characters of this family who are only in individual movies basically yes. like Boromir's yes. only in the first movie and Denethor's only in the last movie uh and obviously Faramir is in the second and third but like you're actually saying here's how all three of these characters across these three movies relate to each other and that's important and I think it's also really important to establish that Denethor specifically sent Boromir to Rivendell to get the ring like that's mm-hmm. a really important fact to to know I think to, uh-huh. to understand fellowship in <laughs> retrospect and understand right. Faramir's motivations in the present. So yes. I, it's a shame because uh, like when watching the theatrical cut, 
that storyline almost I almost kind of tune out during it because I just I don't connect with Faramir or his motivations. And I think it would have been a really different experience if at least that flashback had been put back in. Well, and I wonder, too, you know, knowing how much they changed the character from the book. And of course, they were having to like reshuffle plot points around, but specifically did create a whole sort of character arc in a three dimensional person, as you're talking about, Alex. When I look at the changes that they made from the book, almost always it's to create more conflict in a way that is really meaningful and helpful. We talked in the last one about Gandalf doesn't want to go through Moria and then they like made it. They forced the characters through there. That creates conflict. It's just kind of movie stuff. It's like sort right. of screenwriting -y kind of tricks where it's like, how can we put these characters at odds? It's good. Like all of those decisions are good. And so the things that they did with Faramir, I agree with. But then when you don't show it, have any <laughs> context for why he's acting this way, you added in all of this like screenwritery stuff, but then took out the other screenwritery stuff that makes it make sense. Right. Right. How right. frustrating I would guess for the screenwriters who spent a lot of time crafting that side, that aspect of the character and that side plot. Well, and I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about The Lord of the Rings as a film experiment mm. is you have the fellowship and you're introducing, you know, a, a general audience to this world. And I think you kind of have to craft that film to those people like here's. Yeah, let's make this as accessible as possible. So it doesn't matter as much in, in that one if you cut out details of the world because you kind of just need to get everybody on the same page and bought into this is what's happening right now. But in this second part, and we can talk about middle parts of trilogies in this part, as we mentioned earlier, you have to set up so much more of the world in order for everything else that comes later to make sense. And so it's this kind of I'm sure a very hard balance to strike of yeah. how do we keep it simple enough that we can bring in people that aren't already invested, but also convey enough to tell the story as it develops and gets more complex at the just the relationship between these two movies. And I think maybe that's why I've always the tension between the theatrical cut and extended cut of Two Towers is the most interesting to me because I enjoyed the Two Towers when I saw it in theaters largely because of the battle stuff, because it was just really cool. But I think when I really got hooked into Lord of the Rings is when it came out on Extended and I watched it with subtitles and I finally understood who everybody was and was able to get invested in everything. And so that's partially, I think, why I have this fond memory of the Extended Cut of Two Towers is because I think that journey of I've bought in with Fellowship, I enjoyed Two Towers theatrical, and then I got to dive even deeper into extended is when I really became hooked and then was like fully ready for return of the king. So yeah, it's just a really interesting tension, mm. I think there. Thinking about middle parts of trilogies, one of the things that any middle part of any trilogy pretty much has to do is introduce new characters, right? Mm. Like, so if we think about, I don't know, you know, Star Wars is kind of like the prototypical, here's a right. trilogy that was done well. <laughs> what you have is in the first chapter of it or the first part of it, you introduce us to the central characters of the whole trilogy and bring them together. So they're all off in their own separate places. And then the action of the story forces them together. The plot forces the cooperation and the team building and all of the things that we were talking about with Fellowship, which Fellowship does spectacularly. The second part of the trilogy forces the characters apart again or scatters them out and they have to kind of pursue their different things. And in that prototypical like idea they have to meet new people and that's where all of the new interesting characters come in so in empire strikes back you have yoda and you have lando calrissian and you're introducing new characters and i would say it's not necessarily the wrong call to not give those characters a ton of backstory or a ton of time like mm -hmm. we don't know that much about Yoda or Lando Calrissian in Empire Strikes Back. We know what they need to do in this particular moment or story that the way that they're interacting with the three central characters in that case, but we mm -hmm. don't necessarily need to know a ton about them. Mm -hmm. And so I think following that as a rule of thumb is probably the right call. And also, you know, the balance has to be 
you're introducing new characters in the second part of the trilogy. You're also trying not to lose the characters we already have and care about. And right. that's, I think, it's just a tall order. It's a lot to do. Right. Especially in Two Towers as compared to Fellowship, it sort of changes genres. It's mm. sort of like the thing that you sign up for in Fellowship of these people are going to go on an adventure together stops being the case the as much. Or, <laughs> yeah. Right. It doesn't feel like Frodo and Sam are in this movie, but so much more of it is about Rohan and Gondor and men and Aragorn has this throne that he doesn't want, but he should take. And Gandalf <laughs> has got to go do all the, like there's just so Aaron. many Gandalf more has a lot parts. to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Lots of errands. So it it is a, a really hard. I think that's why I forgive them for making the cuts that they felt they needed to because how do you how do you right how know you? what the right cut is mm-hmm. yeah, or like yeah. how much to include or not include yeah i mean a really interesting thing was i had always just assumed the extended cut was peter jackson saying this is the real movie mm-hmm. uh just because that's so often the case like here's the cut we had to make for the theaters and then here's the real cut especially because very few movies have such a presentation of the extended cut. You know, these beautiful DVDs that were like these leather bound books and everything. It felt okay. like they were like, here's the movie now. The real like, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's always how I took it. And then it wasn't really until we were talking internally about it where, you know, Alex, you were saying, well, I, Peter, Peter Jackson said kind of this and kind of that. And we like looked up the quotes and he's weirdly not said a ton about it, but he did say that they spent a lot of time crafting the theatrical cuts. Uh, and probably more time than the extended cuts because they were like, we this is the movie going out in theaters. This is the movie we have to make perfect. And then he said, to me, those were the the better cuts. But then people say, I prefer the extended. And he says, I, it's impossible for me to say which is better because I'm too close mm. to it. But the interesting thing is I had forgotten until I was researching recently, the extended cuts aren't just they put back some scenes. They went back in and they did pickups howard shore wrote new music they re-edited things they did new graphics like the faramir flashback that was shot after the theatrical cut of two towers was assembled really well was it now was it before like the movie came out were they intending to put it into the theatrical cut no it was it was it was shot for the extended cut of the movie what um yeah so i think that fascinating peter jackson said it's like an alternate version of the same movie and i think that's an interesting huh. way to look at it is that very few directors will say there's this cut and there's this cut. Have fun. They'll say this is the cut. And he said the characters getting their gifts from Galadriel in the first movie. He right. said, I'm really glad we put that back into the, uh, the extended because it's essential to the story. And it's like, <laughs> right. well, if it's essential, you know, um, so, so for him, he, you know, very, they all very carefully made these extended cuts and put them together with a lot of care. But at the same time, you know, he said these are both sort of valid cuts of the movie. One does not remove the other. And I also think it's interesting that these movies came out just a few years before high def surround sound home setups, binging entire seasons of TV shows in a weekend kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, because he sort of didn't expect these movies to necessarily have a life at home because they were these big theatrical experiences. Um, And he's like, oh, people just say, I watched your movies all weekend. And he's like, I I never, it never occurred to me that people would do that uh, or watch them all in a day, you know, which Uh is, uh, so I wonder if these movies had come out 10 years later, if there just would have been one cut that was sort of intended for, or if the extended would have been more of a, like, Basically, if he would have found that perfect middle cut that just sort of has all the essential stuff, but doesn't worry about being too long because people can watch it at home and pause and take a break and watch a disc a night or however they want to do it. So it's just it's interesting, which is why I am generally curious about the Amazon show that they're making Mm -hmm. of Lord of the Rings. The most expensive show ever. (laughs) Right. Wow. Uh, Godspeed. Um, But yeah, that since it is in this format that we are more comfortable with of this long form storytelling that you can kind of tell at your own pace. These movies are kind of a special relic of that time because they existed in this space where it was theatrical, was where the thing needed to live if if it was going to be this big. And now that's shifting and it'll be interesting to see how that translates. It is this interesting thing with middle parts of a trilogy and I'm I want to say this but not end up talking about Star Wars. So maybe I won't (laughs) talk about it too much. There's this inherent challenge, I think, that comes with, as you were saying, Trisha, you have to split everybody apart. Yep. And so much of the magic of the first one is usually 
forcing these people together. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I was thinking also about Guardians of the Galaxy. And I think it's telling when you can look back on a second part or when you think about a series and you consider things introduced after the first one as, well, yeah, of course that's part of it. And mm-hmm. like for me, Guardians of the Galaxy, Palm Clementioff, I forget her name. Mm, yeah. But the Mantis. Yeah. Mantis yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. is like, oh, yeah, no, of course she's part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, but she wasn't in the first one. And so I mm-hmm. feel like those are kind of markers of success or like Lando right. or like, Yo- like Yoda. Yoda. Lady <laughs> wasn't part of Star Wars. Right. Star Wars was once without Yoda. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think it, it is telling. And Lord of the Rings trilogy is different in that they're not really sequels, they're parts. But Obviously, Lord of the Rings without Gollum, like, is insane. And he's such an important part. And, you know, he is teased in in the first one. But I, I just feel like that's... Gollum is just great in lots of ways, is kind of where I'm going with all of this. <laughs> uh, and there's just so much to talk about with him and the construction of him. That was, for me, you know, once again, I read the books right before seeing Two Towers. And so I had a lot of expectations going into this one I didn't have with Fellowship. And a lot of my problems with the movie were now being a book person. And I was like, mm. wait a minute, what's oh. all this like Arwen, like <laughs> <That's> your first <laughs> mistake, dream stuff happening? Like, all right. Why do you have to fall off a cliff so that Arwen could kiss him back to life? And what's happening here? You know, what, what is all this nonsense? <laughs> it's a good dream, Alex. That was <laughs> that was like part of, you know, that was part of my like angst during my first viewing of it. But then the flip side of that was my pleasant surprise at how much they had built upon Smeagol slash Gollum from the books to make him my like favorite character in the movie and such an interesting character and such a sympathetic character in a way that I never a hundred percent felt in the books. And that sequence when he essentially is like an addict talking to himself and, Mm -hmm. you know, go away and never come back like that (laughs) scene was so like emotional and like surprising i wasn't expecting it at all and so Gollum to me was one of the most wonderful surprises of the movie as a book reader where i had i did not realize they were going to go to the depths they were going to go to with the smeagol Gollum storyline and i love the comparison that sort of leaps out to me of Empire Strikes Back as the second part that introduces Yoda that is this mm-hmm. not a human actor on set mm-hmm. giving a performance that does have this surprising depth and you know Lucas wanted Frank Oz to be nominated for an Oscar for Yoda's performance mm-hmm. and I feel like you could argue that Andy Serkis should have like the Absolutely. performance that there has not come true yet still yeah. has not come true uh, for either of them um, but it it's it is just interesting that it's you are introducing a new character that has to play a really pivotal role and have, as you're saying, Alex, depth and complexity, and you're handing it over to not a human. Like nope. you're, you're not, you're not going to be seeing that human on screen, and yet you have to convey that. And so it's it's such a brave choice. And I feel like in both films, Empire and this, obviously it it worked. And that was one of the things that really blew me away. And why this film is like a landmark for CGI is that Mm -hmm. we never had a character like that give a performance with so much screen time also. Mm -hmm. Like that's what struck me. It's just very, very impressive. And, you know, obviously what a changed filmmaking with with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's also interesting that, you know, everyone sort of has seen probably the Andy Serkis next to Gollum side by side with the performance Mm -hmm. where the animators and Peter Jackson were saying like, look at his performance and do what, and basically mimic it anywhere. It makes sense. Sometimes it might not make sense, but, and this was before sort of facial mocap and that kind of thing, you know, so they just had the, the physicality and the voice and Andy Serkis was actually hired as a voice actor. They just said, we need someone to come and do some voice acting for two weeks and then we'll put it into this character and then basically from his audition where he's already spitting all over the place and everything and making his <laughs> his weird faces peter jackson just started saying like i i don't want to separate this vocal performance from this physical performance mm. and then they decided to start actually bringing him on set and andy circus wanted to come and be on set and get into the scenes and everything and they actually shot most of sam and frodo's scenes 
with Andy Serkis and then also where they're miming talking to somebody. And they said they ended up using the Andy Serkis take every time because Makes they sense. had someone to interact with. You could see it in their eyes. that They were actually interacting with this this character. So it's so interesting. And then, of course, Andy Serkis came on to or went on to become King Kong and Caesar and Planet of the Apes and all this stuff. He developed a career as a mocap animal you know actor Basically. kind of thing yeah <laughs> and so much of that comes from the fact that he turned this character from a, just a simple voice gig into this complete thing not by himself obviously the animators did a ton of that work but the fact that so much of it was from his performance and that's where you do start to feel like can we submit footage of his performance for to the academy and have them review that you know, even though <laughs> mm-hmm. it's like not what you see in the movie, it's a weird thing, you know. Well, I mean, people have been saying now for a while that voice acting needs to be an acting category because mm. some of our greatest performances ever are voice performance. Darth Vader is a voice performance. <laughs> you know right, what I'm right. saying? That goes without saying to me and, you know, is is in the camp of, you know, things that we should recognize like stunt work that just for some reason we're not recognizing or like never have and changing like long established traditions about award recognition is for some reason apparently impossible and we cannot <laughs> add categories, which is so nonsense and I, I don't have time to deal with it. But <laughs> I, I think what you're saying, Bri, is what really strikes me about all of the Gollum scenes. I'm going to be real. Gollum doesn't compel me that much mm. as a character. I'm kind of not a Gollum fan. Alex, I can't believe you said he's... I'm so glad somebody loves Gollum, guys. <laughs> I'm so glad about it. I do not love Gollum. And I don't I don't find like Frodo's overarching sort of inner turmoil about what to do about Gollum. I'm just kind of like, wow, you let it go, man. He's a bad guy. <laughs> like, I don't know. But, but I think what you're saying, Brian, is where the triumph is because of Andy Serkis's performance and the fact that he was present enough that the actors themselves, Elijah Wood and Sean Astin, were interacting with him and there, there's this realness to it. I think that's the only reason why it works at all. Mm-hmm. Like the CGI looks good, but I think if you didn't have the performances from the other characters in the seat, it wouldn't necessarily work. And we sure. talked about this when we were doing Jurassic Park, where we were saying like having models even if they don't look like real dinosaurs or whatever which i think the jurassic park models look amazing Mm -hmm. still but having models has an advantage for the actors it's a part of the process and giving actors something beyond like a tennis ball to look at (laughs) has merit in and of itself and i think that that's what really strikes me about watching these golem scenes now you know visual effects and film have never looked actually real no like that's mm-hmm. yeah. that's not really the goal and that's kind of maybe a, a falsehood it's can its emotional effect be real and i think mm-hmm. that's right. kind of what you're you're talking about is it takes a synthesis of you know not just how photorealistic can this image be rendered whether it be pizza or golem <laughs> But like as it sits in the frame and with everything else in the frame, is it believable? Is it affecting the environment physically or emotionally? All those things come together. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, again, just one of the many triumphs of Gollum's that he's he's not just at the time the best rendered animated facial performance ever, sure. but mm-hmm. he's affecting the characters. He's affecting the actors. He's affecting the story. There is you feel complicated about him. Like, I, I think that's. I mean, I don't, but but I know what you I know what you're saying. (laughs) Some people love him and some people hate him like my mother. But I think that that range is in there is what's so telling is that you have a feeling about him. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you don't generally have feelings about inanimate objects or non-existent objects. And Mm -hmm. the magic of film is that you feel some way about Gollum. Mm -hmm. Interesting to hear that there are people that just kind of hate him through and through because I, I understand that for like Return of the King at that point, he's he's gone back to really being owned by Gollum and he is driven by the Gollum side of himself and is kind of one dimensional in that way. But in Two Towers, I really think it's a remarkable like feat that they accomplish of for me, 
basically making him into kind of like a sad puppy dog for parts of the movie where he starts out with this kind of annoying screeching creature who you just don't even want to be looking at. And I think a lot of it's in the eyes. You know, they, if you look at his pupils, they change when he's Smeagol versus Gollum. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, gets, he has those big blue eyes like Elijah Wood kind of mirroring uh, Frodo. <laughs> I do find that they really do the work for me, at least to make Smeagol this kind of victim of, he has like the split personality disorder almost, you know, Gollum is the incarnation, the manifestation of what the ring has done to this otherwise kind of innocent, naive creature, Smeagol. And it's this battle for who's going to like kind of win control of his body or his soul. And I find it really compelling that, you know, his arc in this movie is Smeagol kind of wins temporarily and then through the course of events, through Farmer being a dick and all that stuff, you know, Gollum <laughs> wins by the end. And I think that that struggle for me was actually emotional. Like that it was I was really, you know, sad to see him like, you know, he's doing gross stuff. He's like beating a fish against a rock, but he's like singing to himself like this kind of cu- <laughs> like cute animal. And then he's betrayed by Frodo and people are kicking him and beating him and he's crying like you know, it's. It's way more than I ever would have expected for a character arc for Gollum based on the books. And, mm-hmm. I, and, and the fact that they bothered to take him to those extremes, that really wide range of dynamics, once again, knowing what the material was and what they did with it, it really blew me away. And just really quick, I want to give credit to Fran Walsh, who was one of the writers. She actually, like all by herself, wrote that main Gollum, that, that first mm. major Gollum conversation with himself mm. and directed it. It was just like, really, Fran, go off and like, you, you have this idea for this scene, go off and dire- and like direct it. Okay, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. That like sequence, which is like so pivotal to a story, mm-hmm. like wasn't in the original screenplay. And like as they were wow. filming, she came up with it. So that's crazy because that's like one of the most iconic film yeah. scenes ever. Mm. Absolutely. Fran yeah. Walsh. Yeah, that's really I think cool it was Fran Walsh. I should double check before we publish this, but because it's supposed to be Philip Boyens. But I think it was Fran Walsh. I yeah, I don't okay. think Philip Boyens ever did any like directorial stuff. She was right, right. more like on on the writing side almost yeah. exclusively. Well, and I, I feel like the the writing also does so much of that work. I mean, the performance is great, but as we talked about in the last episode, having levity is useful. And yes. for me, that's when I like Gollum is when he's being funny or he's he's like so over the top dramatic when they're like dragging him and he's in the sunlight and he's like, "Ah!" (laughs) like it's, it's weirdly endearing that he's has enough of a personality to be like dramatic about his suffering. Right. Exactly. He's a drama queen. And so he's he's three dimensional. (laughs) Right. And I think that that pulls me in. And so I think adding that that layer to him also make humanizes him in a way that lets you understand also that he's he's the only one that understands what Frodo is going through. And mm. so he's like basically in the story, he's the only one that has ever babysat the ring for long periods sure. of time. Right. And we right. see what it did, especially in Return of the King, where we see where he began. We can talk about that in there. But <laughs> so I think that combination of he is kind of the you know the foil for Frodo. And he has this, he still has this human side and this levity to him is what endears him to me. I think it was Philip Boyens who referred to Spiegel and Gollum as like a, a, a abusive parent son relationship kind of thing. Well, well Gollum kind of guilt Spiegel. He says, I took care of us. Like I'm, right. I'm the, right, I'm the right. one who's willing to do anything and kill anybody. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we survived because of me and, and it kind of like, gaslighting Smeagol. <laughs> right. And then, and then Smeagol feels like he has to do certain things because like that's what he's told and he doesn't really have a choice and that kind of thing. And uh, and yeah, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of the character, especially the movie version of the character. I think he was a really scary character to me having read The Hobbit at a pretty young age. And I sort of pictured him as like some weird walking jellyfish or something. And it was like... <laughs> <laughs> to, I, like I just remember having some like very strange image in my head of what this thing was that Bilbo was talking to in this cave. So yeah, to see oh now this movie has this like CG character who's kind of childish and that kind of thing that wasn't that didn't sit super well with me at first. I remember even in the theater thinking like this CG character just looks like a CG character doesn't look great, and then even though like. I it was underst- the best ever that you <laughs> right. had seen at that time. Yeah, it, yeah. it's sort of the problem we have now with like Rogue One and some of these other movies that are trying to recreate these characters. It's like, mm. look, it's incredibly impressive. But if it doesn't look real to me, then like 
that's it. It's sort of the uncanny right. valley kind of thing, you know. For me, I prefer like a darker golem. I want to see the last time you see Andy Circus in Return of the King before he has CG eyes, mm -hmm. you know, just like that really wretched, oh, made up, right. you know, crawling yeah. around guy. But as you guys were pointing out, then you don't get the sort of childish victim side of mm -hmm. him, you know, and I think that like the the golem they went with makes a lot of sense. So I, I'm perfectly fine with it. I never disliked it as much as to me, the more these movies get Treebeard and Army of the Dead and Gollum, the more they get yep. CG and that kind of thing, the more I'm like, okay, now I'm a little bit taken out of this, this very real feeling epic world. Yeah. I think the problem for me is that Fellowship did such a good job with Sam and Sam's character and the relationship between Sam and Frodo that I am just with Sam at all times. Mm. And Sam is just like, get out of here, you weird, dangerous, <laughs> little right. tiny monster. Right. Um, and like, <laughs> that's how I feel the entire time that Gollum's around. And, and because Sam is so... Sam is the straight man, essentially, right? Sam has to be infinitely reasonable <laughs> while, <laughs> while Frodo and Gollum are just going Looney Tunes around him at all times where like they're wandering through these super dangerous places and it almost feels like Sam is just trying to like herd cats and be like, guys, right. guys, <laughs> like, straight ahead. Don't look in the cursed water. Just keep walking. All right. Let me make a fire. Let me cook us food. Let's rest now. Like a super reasonable babysitter for all of this. The fact that Frodo is constantly being in any way compelled by Gollum <laughs> and making Sam's job harder it just makes me so unsympathetic toward him. But what a credit to Sean Astin and mm. the writing of the character of Sam. And, you know, like I said, Fellowship of the Ring is just so sells you on that relationship. And it all pays off later, obviously, in Return of the King. Right. Like Sam is absolutely right all along and saves Frodo's butt so many times that like it, it's all there and what it needs to be. And I absolutely think it was like a super brave and interesting and ultimately probably the right and cool choice to spend as much time on Gollum's like arc and inner conflict as we do. I just, <laughs> Frodo <laughs> is so maddening. Yes. <laughs> he really does start to get annoying. Yeah. Yeah. What? He's my least favorite part of this whole Two Towers and Return of the King. I'm like, God, Frodo's <laughs> off doing something dumb again. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I think. Two Towers, Frodo still has my goodwill in Two Towers because I have some sympathy for Gollum. So I understand why he feels bad for Gollum and like wants, I, I, I still kind of buy the idea of like, I want to believe that he can come back or like I can like save him. But then we get to Return of the King. We'll get to this next time. Like, <laughs> it's just like, this is such, you know, you're, you're going to believe Gollum now. right now. Like, come on. <laughs> right. like you're just, Over you're, Sam? You're going to send Sam home by himself from here? Like, <laughs> right. this doesn't make any sense. So no. Give him cab fare. I, I, I kind of become Team Trisha, like, in Return Thank of the you. King, where I'm yeah. like, this doesn't make any sense anymore. But mm. Two Towers, I can still understand that Frodo legitimately, you know, is kind of taking on Gollum as this, like, pet project. So, you know, like, can we... Like, can he be okay? Can I, re can I rehabilitate him after he's been destroyed by the ring? Mm -hmm. Because I think in Two Towers, both Frodo and Sam are still holding on to hope. Like, we're going to go right. home. They're yeah. going to go home. And I, so I think that's where Gollum, I think, works for me, is that it's it's also really just about Frodo. And he's like, well, if I can bring Gollum back, then, like, I can come back. Like, there's that. And right. like, and, you know, and meanwhile, Sam is like, I got to I've rationed all of our stuff for the journey home. And like, you know, we see that contrast later in Return of the King. Mm -hmm. He's there to give Frodo something to do and contemplate, like some external sure. thing for them to be reacting to that's speaking to their inner life. And also is very impressive. CG. Yeah. And it's doing something thematic. It, it really is. You know, Gollum is there to be that sort of dark mirror or that, you know, a clone, I think, is another thing that we've talked about multiple mm. times where characters are there. Like, if you go this direction, this is the place you end up. Right. Yes. And that becomes incredibly clear in Return of the King. It is really smart to have that kind of a character for Frodo where he can just see, you know, 
what might happen to his life if he gives in to all of this temptation and stuff. And so there's a really strong theme running through there. And it's it is good, smart screenwriting just from a character perspective. That is not the most compelling aspect to me. There's lots of other sure. compelling character stuff and thematic stuff in here that's like hits me more personally. But like yeah. over in Rohan, perhaps. Or in the other threads <laughs> that we haven't even touched on yet. Oh, I see what you did there, Alex. Definitely. Yeah, I think Rohan is easily my favorite part of this movie and one of my favorite just aesthetics in the trilogy. You know, it, it's sort of the the Shire for for humans, you know. For dudes. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, I'm so first of all, the the music, like just Howard Shore's score, that it's a it's a Norwegian fiddle that na 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 na. Like so every beautiful. time it kicks in, I just I get love so that theme so much emotional. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Edoras, you know, the capital city of Rohan, is entirely practical. Like yeah. I, they found a hill, and they built all of a those city. buildings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you have um. John Howe and Alan Lee on these movies, who are two of the most renowned Tolkien artists. And they asked them to come to New Zealand for two years and just draw and come up with these things and expand some ideas they had done. And it's so great to see not only the the bigotures, the very large miniatures that they shot, that they they made, you know, which we can talk about more maybe in, in Return of the King, but then to also see the actual things they built, like Richard Taylor, the sort of main set person would come over and say, hey, what is what does the back of this building look like? And John, ha one of them would just draw something real quick and give it to him. And then a few hours later, be like, there it is in real life. You can see it. So cool. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and every actor, Miranda Otto, Bernard Hill, um, yep. Brad Dourif, they all have said it's one of the most beautiful places they've ever been in their life. Like they finished Edoras actually standing on that hill. And uh, and yeah, so I just I really love Rohan. And that's also extended stuff is just more of the Rohanites and I'm like, oh, cool, I don't care if you're just making stew and hanging out and riding on horses, like I'm, I'm here for it. Well, they have to sell us that Rohan is a place to care about visually. So yeah. you're, you're building an entire city for practical reasons because you have to shoot there for a while, but it has to feel like a loss as that city, like they eventually decide to abandon it, right? And then they have to move to Helm's Deep. It has to be like instantly recognized as like a homey place or, you know, a warm house, sort of like in the archetypal way that we've discussed before. It's just really, really cool production design that they're using to visually create attachment to it in the same way that the character, like it feels lived in that throne room and the castle on top of the hill and like those thatched roofs are so mm -hmm. so like medieval peasant village don't you want to live here yeah it's idyllic and the, the colors are all so warm right where mm -hmm. everything's sort of like red and gold and it's just really beautiful you know who doesn't want to live there is michael I, I wasn't saying anything, okay? I was going to let you guys talk about how cool it'd be to live in that place where everything looks like it's dead and the grass is kind of yellow. Like, I was going to say, yeah. where in Middle Earth do you want to live? Is it Mordor? I feel like Minas Tirith is pretty cool. I think this okay. is the most city kind yeah. of place, yeah. Right, totally. yeah. The, the Silver City or whatever. Yeah. It's, like, it's like an Apple product. Exactly. <laughs> Watching Two Towers this time, I was thinking about what you said in the last episode, Tricia, about how there were a lot of historical epics being made at this time. Mm -hmm. And Lord of the Rings kind of feels like a historical epic, even though it's a fantasy movie. And I think when we get to Rohan, that's where it really almost transitions entirely to historical epic, except there's mm -hmm. orcs, you know, you know but, right. but otherwise, a lot of the magic is gone. We're not going through the mines of Moria or Lothlorien or these you know, elvish places. We're thoroughly in this, what could just be like a medieval story. And mm. I think the moment when Eowyn kind of runs out and the wind's blowing and the flag of Rohan like blows off of the pole and yeah. the music is playing, it feels as beautiful and epic and awesome as like anything from Braveheart or those other historical epics Easily. that really inspired me when I was just getting into like adult movies <laughs> as a kid. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I. I I just love that about this movie. It, it, it brings me those gladiator brave heart feelings. Mm -hmm. Also, there are a lot of great slow motion Viggo Mortensen shots in this trilogy, but my favorite is the two doors coming in. I was going to say, I know the one you mean. <laughs> the trailer shot. Yeah. I was okay. going to say, I feel like I know that from the trailer. And like when right. I watch the movie, I'm like, oh, they put that shot from the trailer in this movie. Right. <laughs> 
I watched the trailer for this a lot. Yeah, me too. A lot of hype coming to this movie. Well, and I feel like that's kind of like I was saying earlier, I think that's kind of what made it more access this one more accessible to me because coming into this, I wasn't a huge dragons and dwarves and elves person. And so this two towers one being grounded, I still didn't 100 percent know what was going on, but at least it was like, I know what a human is. And I know what <laughs> they can do and like what's happening. They're riding horses. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that that does help for me anyway, helped bring me into it. Not to talk about the CGI too, too much, but I think Two Towers is interesting because it has this really wide range of approaches to creating beautiful visuals mm -hmm. where there are things like Rohan where you see it and you're like, holy God, that's a that's a city on a mountain. Like, that's really cool. They actually mm -hmm. built it. Yeah. Right. And then there are things like Helm's Deep, which we can talk about soon, where it's like this kind of combination of some of it's real and some of it's like bigotures and but some of it's on a set. And like, so there's all these combinations. There's Gollum, which is like state of the art revolutionary CGI. But then there's also kind of like massive armies of CG people running at each other at times and CG wargs like people still still to this day do not have humans ride a CG animal. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. That was another scene as now as a snobby book reader. I'm like, there's no warg scene in the books and this scene looks <laughs> stupid anyway. Why is this here? It's pretty bouncy, I will say. It's the bounciest scene. That yeah. It yeah. has easily my least favorite shot in the trilogy, which is Legolas pulling himself up onto the horse, and oh. suddenly, and Dude. suddenly they're like, physics don't matter, and like people moving in the way people move don't matter. And then Peter Jackson was like, "What if we made a whole trilogy based on this stupid <laughs> stuff?" <laughs> but then it also leads to one of my favorite shots in the trilogy, which is. Just a handheld camera shot when after Aragorn pulls himself onto the horse and he's just sort of like basically half conscious and he's riding and it's just a camera shot from like the bottom and it's very shaky and stuff. And Michael, maybe that's the kind of shot that you hate because it's I sort feel of... like exactly the opposite. Right. For both of the two things you just mentioned, but <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're invalid. Right. But I like it because it's sort of that shot specifically because it sort of feels real in a way where it, it just makes me feel like, oh, now I'm not watching a blockbuster film anymore. Right. I'm watching just mm -hmm. a character get on a horse kind of thing, you know. And what you were saying earlier, Alex, about the historical part of this before we get too far away from it, is what the thing that really compels me the most about the whole Rohan storyline is, I want to say it's almost Shakespearean, but it's this like struggle for power in like a very earthly human way that really grounds this section, but also Return of the King, where I find the the Theoden stuff and Grim Warm Tongue, Warm -tongue which Brad Dorf is... The best. And <laughs> well, talk about Shakespearean. Was, right. Tommy Wiseau. Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> it's Brad Dorif. Brad Dorif is just, it steals every scene that he's in all the time, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. He's one of my favorite actors, but he's incredible in this, but it, it does feel like this really compelling sort of family, but drama in the way that like Macbeth does, right? Or something like that, where... It's the maneuverings of people within a family, but the fate of the country is sort of on the line. Right. And I think it's incredibly compelling and interesting in the same way that we get from the Gondor storyline, especially going forward into Return of the King. There are these deep personal sort of relationships and like slights and wounds and things that people are grappling with in a very human way. Eowyn and Eomer. Amir, how do yep. we say his name? Amir, <laughs> thank you. Carl Urban. <laughs> They've been orphaned. Theoden has taken them in, so they are loyal to the king. And but Saruman has poisoned the king's mind with the crazy yes, spell that makes them old. Exactly. And but you you see how they are ruling this sort of country, I guess. But it's a small enough country that all of the people matter. All of the people of Rohan matter. And mm -hmm. so when they end up having to flee, it's a small enough group of people that we can really care about all of them. And Eowyn is like deeply embedded in the social structure of them and like caring for the women and children. And like it's a, a very small, homely kingdom and the stakes feel real. It's just great. It's good writing. And I assume it's I assume all of that is straight out of Tolkien. Yeah, well, and and I think that's also why Helm's Deep is so great. 
and that whole battle sequence, yep. I think is as far as like swords and shields battles go, probably my favorite of any movie because it's big enough to feel epic. But as you're saying, small enough that you understand who the people are and you feel like you've gotten to know them. You saw their home. You saw how they got here. And just like logistically, the setup is, you know, you understand the geography of what's happened. Like they've fleed to this point and their backs are against the wall. And here are some front walls that they have to hold. And like, it's just, it's all very clearly set up of how the battle will go down. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes nighttime and then it starts raining. So it's like a battle at night. And they're like, what else do you want? <laughs> check, check and check from Michael. <laughs> right. And I feel like the, the, the CG is there is used, I think, wisely to like set up the scale and stakes of things. But once the battle starts, it feels so real mm -hmm. and you can feel the dirt and the rain on the arms of the orcs and it's 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 so visceral and it somehow i think does a really good job of balancing like creating dynamics within a, a very long battle scene but you never feel like you know, you know the war is still going on so there's never complete relief but there are these like dips or moments where Gimli's gonna make a joke or, or like he can't quite see over the edge and there's just a little bit uh -huh. that keeps it like still fun and engaging or there's like you know they we hold the wall that's fine and then they come with something bigger and then they breach the wall okay so then so there's just this bigger constant ladders bigger mm -hmm. ladders mm -hmm. and this like escalation or then they breach the wall and so we have to fall back to here once we're at this point we can go out the side door and toss Gimli onto the walkway like <laughs> you don't have to toss me <laughs> there's character stuff throughout all that there's really fun action throughout all that and there's the dynamics that keep it fresh and engaging and I just remember being in the theater and having my like my mind blown of like this is what every battle scene should be and I love it so that's my monologue about Helm's Deep and how it's the coolest thing ever. I like it. And it's interesting because I, I feel like when we've talked about our favorite moments from the two towers, my favorite moments are at the very end. Like my favorite moments are the tree beard and the Ents like trashing Isengard. And <laughs> so I've, I've used the word like cinemagasm on this podcast before <laughs> as just, you know, I think it, it's self-explanatory what that word implies. <laughs> and I feel like my first like theater cinema gasm <laughs> this is that's really wow. dirty <laughs> was i mean you originally said cinema g-spot now you've evolved okay. it Dang. into something that's not necessarily any better you can't walk it back now <laughs> i don't know either one either one is the it, it, same meaning same implication uh was the the when you know the, the sun's rising and yeah. they and air going char charge out and gandalf and uh carl urban arrive and it's really it's, it's <laughs> It's really the combination of just all the sound and visual elements at that moment mm -hmm. come together in a way that I think rarely happens. Like, it, like it, it gave me chills in the theater. Like I was I, like my body was reacting to how beautiful the music was like a Renaissance painting with that wide shot of the sunlight streaming in and mm -hmm. Gandalf leading the charge and the two armies and it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever seen, kind of. And then, <laughs> and then right after that, it went to like the most awesome trashing of Isengard and the dam being broken. And mm -hmm. I, I never dreamed that the ending would be so just awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, even from reading the books, the books are very dense and mythic and they don't even paint a very clear picture all the time. So uh, my mind was just totally blown and uh, I appreciated and was into the battle up to that point but it's almost like peter jackson gave me this like extra dessert at the end that was like <laughs> the most tasty dessert and i'm like i am here for the dessert thank you <laughs> this is so great so many that's images that. happening that's my monologue about cinema g spots cinema gasms <laughs> yeah and how peter jackson gave me one well <laughs> I fully agree with everything you both of you just said, Michael and Alex, about Helm's Deep. And I think it goes back to me, it goes back to scale and stakes. What makes Helm's Deep one of the greatest cinema battles of all time? It's that it's small enough in scale and the stakes are totally real and totally grounded for the reasons that I was talking about. Yeah. Thinking about leading up to Helm's Deep, where we understand how desperate the situation is, where you're putting armor on children. 
Right. Yeah. There's a lot of time spent leading up before the battle even happens where the dread is building and building. And we know that they're outnumbered and everyone keeps telling them not like we can't fight. We're not going to win. Like we have to get help. And if it doesn't come, we're all going to die for sure. There's a constant reminder of those stakes. And then the camera and Peter Jackson's direction here spend enough time lingering on the faces of the people of Rohan Mm -hmm. to really, like, their fear. When I think about this scene, what I think about is the fear on their faces or just how grim they look, understanding that this could be the end for them and their entire way of life, basically. And I was thinking it starts all of this sort of the increasing desperation and the building stakes start when we see those two kids, little kids Mm. getting put on the horse by their mother Mm -hmm. and sent out of that city. I think that moment is the most effective, like random civilian moment in all three movies. Mm. Just the mother sending the kids off because later sometimes I get a little, I guess, jaded with like, yes, here's another shot of the sad civilians yeah. <laughs> yeah but but that moment it really plays as powerful like the the performances and the music and the way it's all constructed it's like whoa you got me like i i i suddenly care about these random people where are we rohan i guess like it it's a great start to th- that storyline of you know helms deep and the survival of this region well and as always, if you are going to have a story about rulers or leaders and the people they're leading, then you're going to have to actually have some characters that are regular people that are being led. And I think that this movie does an excellent job of that, that I'm not so sure that Return of the King does quite as well as this. Um, And I think that also just goes back to the scale, right? The Kingdom of Gondor is so much larger than the Kingdom of Rohan. Mm -hmm. And Minas Tirith is a larger city. It's better defended. They have better resources, right? It doesn't quite feel like the David versus Goliath battle that this really feels like. Yeah, it's it's definitely a different battle. And even aesthetically, it's very different. It was during Mm -hmm. the daytime. And it's being led by Gandalf, (laughs) which is very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Which is like, why would you ever have a battle not in the rain? Like, just don't make bad decisions. Like, put. I effort... love the Minas Tirith battle stuff. So I'm going to defend that in the next episode. All right. Well, we'll we'll talk about that. And I think what you're saying, Trisha, is also like you, you do see the rulers and the ruled. And there's also our heroes are kind of in between. Like, there's mm-hmm. so many moments with Aragorn where he gets there and they're like, you know, this is not enough. And he's like, what do you want me to do? Like, we need to put on a. <laughs> Well, Theoden is frustrated too. Yeah, he, he's right? really frustrated. Mm-hmm. Right, and so like you're also like getting like uh, you know Aragorn is getting like little mini lessons throughout about how to be a king, also, mm-hmm. totally. which I think is really cool. And like you see him then kind of he had like I think he and uh, Legolas have a similar moment where Le- Legolas is like, all these people are gonna die. Yeah, and Aragorn's like, yeah, well, cool, that's fine. I'm gonna die with them. Like, we gotta show them like this thing. And then there's the moment with Aragorn and the kid, where the the kid who has mm-hmm. the weapon and he gets like doesn't know what he's gonna do. He's clearly gonna die or whatever. And Aragorn <laughs> has this moment of like, let me see your blade. Like, that's a good. Like, he's kind of yeah. learning how to inspire people. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so there's like character stuff happening while doing everything you're saying, Trisha, building these stakes and spanning the scale. You know, both mm-hmm. sides of that scale spectrum. And so that's what, yeah, I think I think the buildup is so, so great. And then, yeah, for me, I think the execution of it is like just, it doesn't go over the top for me until they're riding down that impossibly steep hill. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, re- it's a really good. Well, and, and it's the right number of tasks at a time. Because as an audience mm-hmm. member, it's hard for you to follow when there have to be 18 tasks. Right. We we can't like track with this character has to do this. That guy has to do this. This is over there. Right. We lose the sense of geography. And again, we also lose the sense of urgency. So if you are intercutting around like that's, I think, one of the big challenges of a battle. If you're shooting a war movie or like a battle sequence in real war, you have like all of these different like divisions that are doing different tasks, right? And unfortunately, you just kind of can't do that in a movie because the audience can't follow it. And so that's another thing that makes Helm's Deep really great is it's the right number of tasks. It's like, Mm. okay, we have Legolas and Aragorn. They're going to do one task. And then we have the main body of the army that's over here. They're going to hold this door. And those are the only two tasks we need to know about for these next five minutes. And then when the door falls and they, you know, they fail at their task or whatever it is, 
Then we have new tasks. We understand what those are, right? Again, it's just a very well-constructed, simple enough, easy to understand enough that every single task feels weighty and we understand kind of how it fits into the whole thing and can follow it. Yeah. And the geography, the design is very simple where it's like, there's one Mm -hmm. door over here. There's the deeping wall here, but it's got a little, you know, Death Star if you shoot here. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Put the bomb inside. Right. But it's simple because you can look at a at a bird's eye view of the battlefield and know exactly sort of where the weaknesses are or where thing where the good guys are winning, where the bad guys are winning, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also yeah. quickly want to shout out Bernard Hill, who yes. I just like I've always liked him in this movie, but it wasn't until this viewing for some reason where I was like, he's really damn good. Like I just, every scene, yes. he's just like really has this weight to it. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to shout him out. Everybody else is great. Miranda Otto is awesome. But just for some reason, this was like my Bernard Hill viewing where I was like, maybe it's cause it's the first time since I've seen, I, I saw Titanic for the first time ever. Uh, last year. <laughs> so yeah, we all like, knew hey. him as Titanic captain when this movie right. came out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's great. And it has to carry so much of the movie. Like, like Aragorn, like a lot of our heroes kind of take a back seat to all this Rohan Mm -hmm. stuff. And so, yeah, Bernard Hill has to do a lot of the heavy lifting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two Towers is really great. There's this epic finale that sets up the return of the king. And so I'm excited for next episode where we can talk about just all the hype and expectations and how you end a crazy story like this. Uh, yeah, there's there's so, and the endings. How many endings is the right number of endings? There's a lot of things we can talk <laughs> All about. All of them. <laughs> All of them. Every single one. For now, why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from the two towers. Ryan, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, mine's about the editing, actually. Not just post-shooting, but also just the editing of any script, You know, even if it hasn't been shot yet. We, we talked about how the extended cut makes the battle feel like a smaller portion of the movie. And that's, that's already just a nice lesson of, you know, a 10 page scene in a movie in a 90 minute movie is going to feel very different compared to a 10, that exact same scene in a two and a half hour movie, for instance. But on top of that, it was fascinating to see how much of the ending of the two towers was sculpted in the edit. You know, Trisha, you were mentioning intercutting between the battle about to start and then the civilians huddled indoors, that was an editing thing that wasn't written into the mm-hmm. script. It was just in the edit. They said, oh, wow, if we have Aragorn about like bracing for battle and then we cut to these other people, suddenly Aragorn is protecting those people. He's not just a guy, you know, about to get in a fight. But because this is the middle movie and because they put Shelob in the third movie, they really didn't know where this movie was going to end when they were when they started cutting it together because they shot all three movies at once. Mm. Fellowship was pretty clear where it was going to end. And with Two Towers, they kind of said, well, obviously it ends after Helm's Deep and Isengard, but we're not sure what the ending is. So originally it was going to have the confrontation with Saruman, which is in the extended cut at the beginning of Return of the King. But after the finale of Helm's Deep and the finale of the ends at Isengard, they said, you know, we're, we're done. We're, we've ended the movie. We can, we need to kind of move on. But they also realized that while they had a narrative end, they didn't have a thematic emotional ending to the movie. So Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens had written this speech for Sam, you know, folks in those stories, they were holding on to something like, are you about to talk okay. about what I was going to do for my lesson? <laughs> Is it Sam's monologue? It's not about the monologue itself. <laughs> okay. It's about the fact, I mean, maybe this will um, overlap with what you're going to say, but it's about the fact that in the edit, they realized mm-hmm. that if they not just had that scene sort of as like the denouement of the Sam and Frodo storyline, but also used it, used yeah. the audio of it over footage of the denouement of Helm's Deep and Isengard, suddenly now it's tying everything together. And now it feels like this movie has an end where it's not just, well, that thing's done, that thing's done, that thing's done, credits, see in a year. It's now we're tying everything together and making this end. Long lesson short, just restructuring is <laughs> as important as rewriting. You know, if you like never stop thinking about how your scenes that you're writing can be moved around or intercut all these ways that might make something stronger by putting two things next to each other. Does that make the dynamic better? Does it make it worse? Does that take away from something? Like they thought Shelob would just cancel out Helm's Deep and stuff. They said, that's too right. much. We need to right. push it away yeah. because then your brain starts going. There's too many things happening. There's too many climaxes and finales happening right now. And yeah, the more you can think about that stuff at a script level, the less you have to be hoping your editor's really damn good and can figure all that stuff out. Totally. Well, yeah, does that dovetail Trisha, nicely with your lesson? 
I have heard Sam's monologue from the end of this movie probably 18 times. And you know what? It makes me cry every time <laughs> now still. And I'm just like, I know exactly what he's about to say. And it's still really emotional. And I think the reason I think the reason is that it's engaging something thematic that the movies are doing on a meta level almost, right? Because partially because the text of the monologue is about tales and stories, right? Sam starts off by talking about, think about the stories that really matter. Why do we care about them? And so I think these three films, there are so many different dramatic arcs and a lot of different themes happening. But this monologue is a reminder of why stories matter and why even big, sprawling, epic stories. In fact, maybe those most of all, why those stories matter. And I think it's engaging with that in a way that A, ties these movies together because in a lot of ways, when you think about the disparate plot lines of The Two Towers as a film, you're kind of like, so this is about who? Like, <laughs> right, there's, right. there's there's really three <laughs> completely separate storylines where you have Mary, right, right. Pippin, and Treebeard. And then you have like all of the, well, and Gandalf doing his errands. <laughs> then you have, um, you know, all of the Rohan stuff and, and like the main heroes there at Helm's Deep and that whole thing. You have even have some Sam. like elf like Zoom calling happening just to like give us an update. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's get to elves in the next one. Okay, ne we're gonna talk about elves next time. Yeah. Next time, I have, I have whole, whole thoughts on elves. There's a disjointed experience potentially if you can't tie it together thematically, and that's a really tall order for one monologue to do. But because the monologue is textually engaging with narrative itself, right? When we talk about what narratives are, they are basically assigning meaning to disparate events in the first place. That's mm. what a narrative is. Right. You're selecting events, standing them in a line and saying, when we put all of these events in a line, they have a meaning. And that's the theme is whatever that meaning is. With all of these events, their relationship is not particularly obvious. Their thematic relationship is not particularly obvious. So this monologue is a reminder that, but this is a story and you're being told a story. So stay with us, right? That is, I think, exactly the thing that's needed here. And it's a really brilliantly written monologue. And to give it to Sam is, I think, so smart because he is sort of the character in a way that doesn't change. And, right. and it creates this sort of POV person for us to cling to as a mm -hmm. reminder of like, we're on this journey the way that Sam is. And we're like along for the ride, just hoping beyond hope that it turns out okay. Yeah. Like you were saying, I feel like that putting disparate events next to each other creates meaning also ties in exactly with what you were just saying, Brian. It's like yeah. editing. That's, that's yeah. what film is also. is like <laughs> literally putting different frames next to each other. And when we watch them back to back, they create meaning and, and being able to wield that as part of the tools of, of a storyteller. And yeah, I, I, when watching it this time, I definitely became emotional during that monologue in a way that I didn't when I was 15 or whatever, obviously, because mm -hmm. of all the things that, yeah, you just said, Trisha, as you're pointing out who you give it to and how it engages with the story is important because just having someone talk about the importance of story at the end of your movie or <laughs> TV doesn't, show doesn't always doesn't do it. always do it. Nope. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful <laughs> monologue and and Tyrion took some notes but didn't quite land it <laughs> it's the pureness of sam's belief right? right i think is really what carries that too i love sam he's the best yeah. well speaking yeah. of sam the part that always gets me is the next part with the samwise the brave moment mm. uh -huh. where you know when frodo mm. turns to him in, in all seriousness you know frodo wouldn't have made it very far without sam and how much that means to sam to mm. hear that and yeah it's so Wonderful. And then we get Return of the King where Frodo just treats him like dirt the whole time. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely bothers me. Yep. In the next yeah. Movie. Alex, what about you? What's your lesson? My lesson is get Howard Shore to score your yep. trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, like, who would have thought? Like, he hadn't done, you know, he'd done a lot of great movies, but he wouldn't have been the natural first choice, I don't think. You know, Hans Zimmer had done Gladiator and uh, we had John Williams. You, you wouldn't have thought of Howard Shore as being the person to helm like the biggest trilogy of the time. But 
I'm so happy he ended up being paired with this movie. It feels like part of the lightning in a bottle magic Mm -hmm. that came together because he took it so seriously. He went as deep as all the other departments did as far as the research and having the choir sing in Elvish or Dwarvish or having like, I don't know how many separate themes he composed. Some of the behind the scenes, he said how many like different actual themes he composed for this trilogy. But it's way more than even like I think a Star Wars trilogy has because you can feel musically the difference when you enter Rohan, when you enter Lothlorien, when you're in a Gollum scene or when you're in a Gondor scene. And the music kind of does this unconscious work through the entire trilogy to really kind of just further build out the world. Like, like it gives the different parts of the world their own feeling tone and even different like thematic ideas, their own feeling tone. Mm-hmm. Like the, the ring has a musical tone to it. And yeah, it, it's, just, it's doing so much hidden work that we just take for granted. But I think these movies would feel so much less magical if it weren't for like the richness of the score. So God bless Howard Shore and mm-hmm. yeah. the investment that he put into these movies. And, and some of my favorite themes from all three films pop up in Two Towers. You know, it's one of the things that's really remarkable is he could have just kind of leaned on the work he did in Fellowship and just continued it. But he introduces so many new themes in Two Towers. And they're some of my favorites of the whole trilogy. So yeah, when this when the soundtrack came out, I was like, this was like my like background music for everything. <laughs> and this of the three is the one they didn't nominate for mm. an Oscar. They what? nominated the other two. That's crazy. And didn't nominate this one for an Oscar. I mean, they all have amazing music, but it's just that that's so. I know what? it's crazy town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Alex. I don't know why you thought it was a weird choice. I mean, they were going to make a fantasy epic trilogy and they said, let's get the guy who directed the Frighteners, the guy who scored Dogma, the kid from Flipper. Like we're going to, like, what's confusing? <laughs> You're right. Right. I loved Flipper. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, the other thing with, uh, with his score is, first of all, he spent two years just working and collaborating with the filmmakers. You know, it's, it's lovely anytime you see that he's sitting in a room with Peter Jackson and Peter's like, maybe we we'll just hold that note a little longer until we cut to that shot. And he's like, yeah, I was thinking that. Okay, cool. You know, just like how intricate some of this stuff was. And uh, I also just love all the, like, I'm just a sucker for like the female vocalist solo stuff, which there's like five different female so vocalists much. in two yeah. towers also only like the, the little boy child vocalist that comes oh, yeah. up for, right, when, right. The, when the ants are marching to isengard and when gandalf goes down the hill like it, it right. adds that like mm-hmm. extra layer of magic yeah and uh the cool thing is a lot of the lyrics that that are being sung in those solos some of which are just these background things you don't even realize somebody is singing but it's fran walsh and philip boyens writing lyrics in sort of a Tolkien-esque way about whatever's going on at that time, whatever the emotion is. And then they got, I remember, I forget his name, but a Tolkien scholar to then translate those into Elvish. And then that's what's being sung. I'm just like, yep, I like all those things. Keep doing it. You know, that's why the music feels like it's in the same league as every other department on this film where like there was love. Like you don't Mm -hmm. do that unless you're like in love with what you're doing. And I, you you feel that in the finished product that no matter the imperfections, there's like love being put into every aspect of this film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I feel like music is the place where, you know, it can it can do a lot of that heavy lifting and that connective tissue of making movies hard and you're not going to get everything perfect. Right. And watching this movie on mute would be a very different experience. But yeah, having that that love in the music bring out the love in every other part of it i think yeah. is what's what's makes it extra special and and incredible mm-hmm. yeah my lesson i'm trying i'm kind of going back and forth but I, I think i've i've ended up now thinking a lot about the second parts of trilogies and how that compares to just like a normal you know the the three-act structure in a normal film mm. and why the second parts are usually when i feel the most in in trilogies like empire you know not when i was a kid because i wanted space blow up stuff but like as <laughs> as an adult empire is where i feel the most in the original star wars trilogy the two towers is where i feel the most in this trilogy temple of doom 
Uh, <laughs> that doesn't count because that was a prequel. Uh, yeah. yeah. It is a prequel. It's a weird like middle yeah. part of a trilogy. <laughs> if you're going chronologically, since there's a fourth Indiana sure, Jones, sure. then really the Last Crusade is the second part, which is where I do feel the most. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it kind of all, I guess, clicked for me with what you were talking about, Trisha, and Sam's monologue, is that I feel like this is, it's in these moments and the story where it is sort of the darkest hour in a lot of Always, ways. Always, yeah. The story kind of crystallizes what it's about and what it means. Mm. And I feel like that's what happened for me in The Two Towers is that, you know, they got to this place where it looked like there was no hope, but it was still, like, it doesn't go over the top. And I think that's kind of the the curse of a, a final part is you have to outdo everything you've done you before. Do. And... Yeah, that's all, it's almost like a curse of doom. Someone said <laughs> Temple of Doom, and now I'm all confused. <laughs> Mount Doom. It's Mount Doom. It's, it's the one you're thinking yeah, of. Doom. The curse of Mount Doom. Thematically, and also in the filmmaking, in the tools used in this one, there's this kind of restraint that lets it all feel within this scale that is comprehensible, and then lets it all resolve into like, this is what this story is about. And I just love that. So that's, yeah, I don't know if that's a lesson, but it's a thing I, I think about whenever I watch a trilogy or series of movies and, and just how do you how do you land a part three? Tune in next time when we talk mm-hmm. about Return of the King and, and discuss all of that. Mm-hmm. What have you guys been watching? Alex, what have you been watching recently? I just started watching Search Party on HBO Max. It started off as yeah! a TBS show. <laughs> And then got picked up by HBO Max, and I can tell. I'm so happy. I can tell why. Yeah, it's (laughs) because it's HBO Max quality. It's just like brilliant writing. So I don't even know how to describe it. And I I hear it changes and completely evolves Mm -hmm. over seasons. But it's essentially this like it's like this genre bending millennial satire. It feels both like a broad city, almost like New York millennial satire, at the same time as it's. A mystery. Like mystery. Like, yeah, it's called Search Party because it's like a missing girl. The writing and the humor is right up my alley. It is doing something I didn't even know I wanted. <laughs> and so I, I, I don't even know what to say about it besides check it out. And if it's your cup of tea, it'll be really be your cup of tea. And uh, Aaliyah Shawkat is the lead actress, and I just love nice. her so much. So check it out, HBO Max. All of the four central characters are amazing, and the performances are incredible. Yes. The first three episodes of the fourth season are coming out this week, so they'll be out. It'll be in the middle of season four. Search party, yay. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time to get into it if you want to check yeah. it out. Awesome. Nice. Trisha, what have you been watching? So speaking of coming out this week, I saw Promising Young Woman which is from 2020, but is being released widely this week on VOD. And it stars Carrie Mulligan, Laverne Cox, Bo Burnham, Alison Brie, Alfred Molina, and a ton of other people in small roles, like Molly Shannon's in there, Mm. and Adam Brody's in there, and Max Greenfield. And like it is written and directed by a woman named Emerald Fennell. And it is... I, I just can't wait for people to watch it. It is this uh, sort of, yeah, revenge, like dark revenge fantasy um, about a young woman who decides to take revenge on men for sexual violence that happened to her in her past. It is loaded. <laughs> <laughs> it is politically loaded. Um, and Carrie say. Mulligan's incredible in it. Nice. It's so fascinating. I have so many thoughts about it and I just want everybody to watch it so I can start getting into conversations about it. Um, The trailer when it dropped, you know, months and months ago now um, really made a splash of its own. So if you want to see like whether or not you'll like it, you can check out the trailer. It wasn't exactly what I thought it would be from the trailer. That's what I've heard. I've heard it gets a little more interesting. Yeah. But what it is, is really fascinating. Right. Um, hmm. So, yeah, definitely recommend Promising Young Woman. I remember being on board when I saw the trailer a year ago and then yeah, yeah, yeah. things happened. And I was like, it's finally coming out. So excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. It's coming out on VOD this week. Brian, what have you been watching? I read a book. No. What is that? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not like the most impressive book to have read. I read uh, Ready Player Two. Oh, nice. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. And I just finished reading it recently. Uh, it, it's gotten a lot of mixed reviews, and I don't think any of them are wrong necessarily. But ultimately, I was just really happy to be back in that world with those characters. Some of the story is really 
smart and interesting. It makes for some really interesting discussion. Just the first couple chapters is like, ooh, what would I do in this situation? E, I don't know whose side I'm on here. It like really kind of goes there. Mm -hmm. And then some of it feels very forced and flat and like, okay, it's just sort of story stuff. You know, here's like the bad guy and here's what they're doing and that kind of thing. But a lot of it is just fun. Here we go again. What kind of fun stuff can we get into this time? The first time that there's like a multi-chapter we're in the world of this IP and we have to like solve puzzles in it and stuff. I was just, I'm, I'm yeah. on board. I'm, I'm totally <laughs> into it. Uh, but yeah, if you enjoyed the first book, I think it's definitely worth uh, giving the second book a shot. And if you've only seen the movie though, read the first book. Do not say, oh, I saw the first movie. I'll read the second yeah, book. Yeah, do not do that. Because you have not seen the first book as a movie. <laughs> but yeah, I, I enjoyed it and I, and I sort of was, was really happy that I had read it by the end. Nice. Awesome. Michael? So I have finished The Mandalorian season two. I said I'd oh, check in, and so I'm, I'm checking in. Here we go. By the end of season two, I was looking forward to watching the next episode several times. <laughs> <laughs> wow. A ringing endorsement. <laughs> Here it is. So, and I, I can understand like why people are excited about it. And mostly I like, rather than even talking about how I felt about it, I, I feel like I want to have a conversation, as I alluded to last time, about what is Star Wars and what do people want from mm -hmm. Star Wars is a question that feels like an existential question to me because yep. I'm me. <laughs> me too. Right. Yeah. I'm, yeah. We're definitely not the only people. I don't know what I want from Star Wars anymore, Like, which is, <laughs> which is kind of disturbing to feel like it Who feels like it's we? lost meaning. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I think that's that's mostly been my experience is like every episode. I'm like, I don't know who I am. I feel like I'm unmoored <laughs> from my previous reality. <laughs> but so like, like technically, it's very impressive. There's a, there are a lot of really fun characters. The the diversity of the director slate that they use uh, is really, really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Bryce Dallas Howard has directed several of my favorite episodes, which is like totally really cool. Yeah, there's definitely just stuff there and I want to talk about Star Wars and what is Star Wars and does Star Wars need to be examined at this depth and does it fall apart when it's too closely examined because it's right. kind of like but we'll where talk are we going to have this conversation? I don't know but in the meantime we can talk about it on Discord <laughs> <laughs> We actually have been talking about it on Discord, though. Like, uh, right, yes. For real. For sure. So when you sign up for our Patreon, you get access to our LFTS slash Beyond the Screenplay Discord. There has been a lot of conversation about The Mandalorian. I muted the Star Wars channel wow. uh, up until now because I hadn't said anything about spoilers. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. now I'm going to go back and read through. But it's a great time to join and share your thoughts in Discord. We're, we're on Discord a lot. Uh, so come chat with us. Anyway, this has been... Our conversation on the two towers. <laughs> We're nearing the end of our journey through Middle Earth. Kind of. We still have well, the Hobbit movies. I still have but... to watch all three Hobbit movies. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yikes. Our first journey through Middle Earth. Um, so yes, thank you as always to the patrons for making this show possible. Beyond the Screenplay is produced by Vince Major. Our editor is Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Arand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are, as always, in the show notes. Send us a tweet. Say hi. Tell me what your thoughts are about Mandalorian. I do want to know what people think. Um, and also, I guess, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, too. So thank you for listening. Again, if you are listening on Spotify, leave us uh, an answer to your mm -hmm. thoughts on theatrical or extended cut. Maybe now that you've heard our conversation, that your answer will have changed. I don't know. We look forward to seeing it. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.